Okay, hi everybody and welcome to tonight's In Conversation With, um, hosted by me, Martin Sixer, um, and for Thomas Coughlin's to Trust. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. So just to anybody that might be joining us for the first time that's using a, a screen reader, don't worry, you're, um, we can't hear you and your video isn't on. Um, it's in a webinar format, so uh, the only thing that we can see on the screen is, is myself and, and Jesse that have guest this evening. Um, also, just to uh, let everybody know, we will be recording this this evening. Um, and we'll be uploading it on our website afterwards, um, so anybody can, can go back and watch it or, or share it with your friends and family or whoever. Um, we are going to have a little bit of time for question and answers at the end, so what I'd ask you to do is um, just to, uh, there's a question and answer box, if you can put your questions in there and we'll visit them um, after, after the um, conclusion of the, of the um, towards the end of the, the conversation which is um so yeah uh so yeah tonight uh in conversation with so just to give a bit of background we um have asked jesse dufton to join us this evening um and it's just a chat to talk to somebody about their career how they got into it um and you know how it is doing that particular role as a as a blind or partially sighted person um one of the things that we kind of asked a lot is to is to say more about the jobs which blind and partially sighted people do and how they do them and, and this seems like a really good, good opportunity to do that. So, um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll just ask you, Jesse, if you could just give a quick, quick introduction, please. Sure. Uh, so I'm Jesse Dufton, um, probably best known uh, for appearing in Climbing Blind, the film on C4 recently, but we're not really going to be talking that much about climbing today. Uh, we're going to talk about work. Um, so work-wise, I work for a company called Intelligent Energy um, that make hydrogen fuel cells and um, I look after their patent portfolio. for them. Cool, that's great. Thanks very much. So um, I think we'll get started and, and I've got to be honest, I, I looked this up today. So um, can you just tell us what a, a patent engineer um, does? Like what, what, is, what is that job and you know, what does Day -day yeah sure so everyone always asks me like oh what do you do and my title is principal patent engineer and i realize that means nothing to most people <laughs> um so essentially what it is is um i work for a tech company as i said um and the company we make these hydrogen fuel cells so it's like a bleeding edge piece of technology and obviously we've got to protect that investment um that we're making in this new technology somehow and there's various different um, forms of intellectual property rights that you can get. And one of those is patents. So you might have heard of, of those. Um, my role is essentially to um, be the bridge between the engineers who are doing the work, um, designing the fuel cells and um, optimizing them. And the patent attorneys and a patent attorney is a specialized type of lawyer that specializes in um, you know, getting these these patents granted. Um, so patents, you have to have a formalized application procedure where you apply to the patent office with your new piece of technology and say, please, could I have a patent for this? Um, so my role is essentially kind of, on the one hand, being the bridge between the engineers and the attorneys when we're drafting something new. And then on the other hand, looking after the portfolio of patents. So kind of managing which ones we're going to um, continue with which ones we're going to let go and kind of balancing that so we've got a really strong intellectual property portfolio. Basically. Okay. Yeah, that, it, sounds, it sounds really interesting and, and I've got to be honest, that's the, the first, first person that I've ever spoke to that, that does that job. So, you know, it, it, it does sound... It's pretty it niche. Really, yeah, <laughs> it's quite niche. Yeah. Well, I've got, yeah, it is really niche. So kind of, how, how did you get into that? Um, so I first kind of became aware of patenting and uh, intellectual property uh, as part of my degree. So uh, in my degree, I did like a placement year where I went out to Holland um, and worked for a, com a company. Um, and as part of the kind of placement, you had to do a little project where you uh, found out about the company you were working for's um, intellectual property like strategy. Um, mm. They patent things, did they keep things as trade secrets, 
how did they do that? And I was lucky enough to um, talk to someone who was essentially doing the role I'm doing now. And they explained to me all about the patenting system and, um, you know, how it works. And it's something I'd never even really considered before. Um, but it, what I found was it's really interesting. Like, I find that it's a really complicated system that you've got to understand really in, in massive detail to be able to understand what the optimum solution for a given situation is. Um, so that's when I first became aware of it. And then, so that was in the third year of my undergrad. Um, and then obviously I finished my undergrad, did my PhD. And then it was only after I left university that I, you know, tried to get, get into the IP profession. Yeah, so, so what was that kind of, you know, how was, how was that kind of post-graduation and, and finding your, your first job? Was it, you know, was it, was it challenging? Was it, was it fairly, fairly straightforward? Did you have a lot of questions? Uh, reasonably challenging. So um, IP is a very, very competitive area. Um, it's very interesting and it's very well rewarded. Um, but the flip side is that the entry requirements are very high. So um, it was quite hard to initially kind of get that first toe in the door. Um, and I, uh, after I finished my PhD, I went and worked for a, uh, like an energy, uh, a small energy company. Um, and I went and did a little mini pupillage for an IP barrister to kind of get some experience. Um, and those pieces of experience enabled me to get uh, like a place in my current role and I started on their graduate scheme and went through there and kind of worked my way through and then at the end of my graduate scheme I joined the IP department internally um, and then yeah um, got from there got training in, I, in IP um, and went on to went on to yeah work in that department. <coughs> Was it, was it fairly, how was the kind of going through the graduate, um, you know, the that kind of whole process? Because they're, they're super, super competitive a lot of the, a lot of the time, aren't they? And it, it's a lot of, kind of what, you know, uh, yeah. and things like that. So. I mean, they are competitive. Um, I think the thing that uh, stood me in good stead was that I had um, a technical degree and a PhD in the right technical area. So... Yeah. Um, my undergrad was in chemistry um, and then I did a PhD on in materials chemistry looking at um, like solar cell materials and while it, solar cells and fuel cells aren't you know directly um, you know they're not the same there are some commonalities there so having a clean energy PhD um, and you know experience um, at a at a, um, a clean energy company before I, before I was applying for um, my current my current job and um, that's really stood me in good stead I think um, and that enabled yeah. me to kind of stand out. Yeah 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 it's, it's kind of yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a really really like kind of great, great achievements through that process. So. so when you were kind of looking for you know when you were doing the, 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 the little placements and stuff that you'd, that you'd spent you know it was was this all with the intention of you being kind of new long term where you where you did want to go and those were the steps that you used to just to start building up that experience and things like that? Uh, yeah I think so um so I, yeah, I knew that I wanted two things. I wanted um, a job in intellectual property because I find it really interesting. Um, there's the understanding the complexity is one thing. Um, and there's like um, the fact that by definition, when you're in, working in an uh, IP um, or intellectual property, uh, everything is always new. Patents have to be for new inventions. You can't get them for anything that's old. So you're always getting a new challenge every every time. Um, so it never stale in that respect. And also, so that was the first requirement. And the second requirement was that I wanted to work in like clean energy. Um, mm -hmm. That was something that I've always had a, an interest and a passion for, and it was what my, my PhD was in. So the kind of to try and find a, a role that married those two was always the objective, I think. And it was yeah. Incrementally, okay, I've got, I've done this one thing that enables me to get the next 
placement or whatever that builds my CV and enables me to get out on towards the final objective. Yeah, yeah, which I think is true for everybody, isn't it? You know, like you, yeah. you, you know, you, if you if you have a goal of, of where you want to get, then it's there's a series of building bricks that you've, that you've kind of got to do before before you get there, and, and that can be you know, doing doing some voluntary work or you know even some work or uh, placements somewhere. You know, and I think I think all that sort of stuff is, is really important. And, and it helps with that motivation as well, doesn't it? So that you're striving towards something and, and you take it off like kind of another box, if, if you will. So, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll be honest though, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. <laughs> I, think I, only, it, so. <laughs> I think I only really had a clue, like when I went into this placement, IP yeah. was the first thing that I thought was really interesting. I was like, oh, I might actually want to do this as, you know, uh, a, a career because before that I was like yourself I didn't have a clue what I wanted yeah. to do you know something it's, all involving technology and that was about all I had so. yeah yeah and it's it's kind of it's asking them it's asking them questions isn't it because you know you see yourself that you were you were on that placement and you got speaking to somebody that, that was essentially doing the job that you're doing now so you got that insight into into what the, you know what that job's like and think kind of you know I, having conversations with people and finding out a bit more about their jobs and what they do is like a really really great way to, to find out what a job, jobs kind of really like and, and you know what people do as well so um, yeah it's yes really really good so what um what sort of um you know assistive tech are you using in in this role I, i'd imagine there's a lot of it's a lot of kind of writing and paperwork is it or yeah so um mostly i just use I, I just use a screen reader so uh, well i have a couple um so i have uh zoom text and narrator on my uh, work laptop and then i also have like a, a tablet with a clip on keyboard which is, runs android so you've got talk back so you've got like yeah. three screen readers um and i find what works really well for me is that all of them have their faults but <laughs> You use if you swap between them you can usually do most things um so i find yeah. better for if i'm using excel and then obviously narrator is really good if you're navigating around windows and if i'm browsing the web i'll probably use talkback on an android device they're kind of good at different things in my opinion yeah yeah so it's interesting that you use narrator there's mm. not many people that i know that, that use that so do you find just because it's free and it's there <laughs> okay <laughs> Fair, fair play. Um, and kind of when, so when you started and getting that assistive tech in place, did you, I, I assume you kind of had to tell your employer what, what you needed, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, it largely came from me. Um, so when I first started um, at Intelligent Energy, I was just about getting away without a screen reader and just having things using magnification. Mm. Um, then obviously as I lost the last tiny bits of my site, um, I was like, right, well, I need a screen reader now. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, um, and yeah, that was a fairly, fairly painless process really, you know, go and talk to IT, probably a week later it was all set up. So yeah, oh, that's, that's, it wasn't yeah. really hard at all. Yeah, it's really, really, really good, yeah. And is there kind of any, any aspects of the role which, you know, you found that this is the tech just doesn't, yeah, doesn't, doesn't. doesn't cover uh, pictures yeah. so um, patent applications inc often include pictures um, and there's no real way with current technology of interpreting those into a form that's that a blind person can you know can yeah. I can make use of those um, so I think that's the main thing but that's only really a tiny portion of my role like the main thing is uh, having the technical understanding. So being able to talk to the engineers about when they've had a, um, you know, an, a new idea and being able to understand what they're going on about when they're talking about crashing cathodes or whatever, you know, you've got to have that technical, technical understanding um, yeah. as a primary requirement, really. Yeah. 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 And um, how were, you know, it's not, you know, what, did you encounter any, um, you know, any, any issues at the, at the application process when you were kind of going for the role? You know, did, were you, did you were you kind of straight in there and, and told them what you know what you about about the your kind of site loss or did you kind of 
my it's a while ago stuff. now and i'm struggling to remember i don't remember <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember having any issues no my, uh, yeah. like i intelligent energy have been really great um uh like kind of inclusivity wise you know mm. it's been um uh something that's a detriment to me um uh they've always had a really kind of positive outlook on it and like okay well it means that we're going to have to change some things but that's not a problem you know we have to change things for all our all our employees to a certain extent so yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's really good yeah really really positive and, and yeah it sounds, sounds like a, a really good really good company to be working for as well so. <laughs> um so yeah i guess i would you would you recommend <laughs> would you recommend uh intellectual property is a is a career um, i think it's a uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I mean, um, I will say that it's yeah uh, a difficult, to, um, difficult kind of area to get into. You know, yeah. while you have to have at least a master's level degree in a technical subject, um, and probably to stand a chance, you've got to have a PhD to get into. Yeah. You know, um, uh, to stand a good chance um and you know that's not you know that's not to be diminished you need that level of technical understanding um for some of the for some of the for some of the work um i work you know clean energy technology but quite a lot of people who work in the intellectual property field work in the pharmaceutical industry and unless you have a phd in the relevant area you're just not going to be able to understand what this invention's about so that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like it was a hell of a, you know, a hell of a lot of hard work to, to get to get to yeah. where you are. I've actually got, um, you know, and that's, but, you know, uh, it's kind of true of any, any profession. There's a, there's a lot of hard work which causes us into getting that job, isn't it? You know, so, um, I think there is, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, like, just looking at, you know, you, uh, you've done a PhD in, um, in uni and stuff, how... Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, was, how was that experience? How was, how was uni like? You know, did, was that kind of straight, straightforward as, as kind of work speed or um, different challenges? Yeah, um, I think it was, uh, it was certainly, I had more sight when I was at, at university than I do now. So mm -hmm. I basically have only light perception. So I don't have any useful sight. I can't read anything anymore and I can't recognize pictures or anything like that. When I was at uni, yeah, my sight was terrible, but it was still, I was still able to, just about able to read and get around on my own. Um, so um, I did the chemistry as my undergrad. And I think the main thing that was challenging was all the lab work, going and kind of, you know, measuring chemicals, doing reactions, stuff like that. That was a bit tricky, but I'm very proud of the fact that of my group of friends, I was not the one that got the nickname Mr. Smashy Smashy in the lab. <laughs> That went to someone else because the glass <laughs> where he broke was just unbelievable. <laughs> um, no, that was could, tricky, and also much. not being able to read the um, board in real time. Um, so I would get copies of kind of lecture notes after the fact. Um, yeah. That's yeah. not as easy as if you had if you were able to see the board while the lecturer was explaining things, and you could kind of oh yeah yeah. And I think that is something that um, people who are at university now um, have got a definite advantage because so much more of the learning is digitized. I mean, it's not just some guy scribbling on a chalkboard at the front of the room, which you have to write down. You'll have, you know, PowerPoint slides that you can get in advance so you can, you know, follow along as the lecture's going. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, what sort of adjustments did you did you make to be able to you know to, to do the all the all the lab stuff? Like that? I imagine that you, uh, again, like you know, like we said with work, you, you were the one that had come up with these solutions, right? So they uh, so they were kind enough to give me a, a minder, as it were, were for the, <laughs> the stuff. <laughs> so yeah, that was help, that was helpful, um, but also things like um, most of the things you can you can get around. So. Um, if you're measuring a liquid and if it's water for example then you know the density of it and you can just weigh it rather than measure the volume um yeah. so um you can do stuff like that um but yeah there was some things where a, a helper was helpful um but the other thing was that i stopped doing lab work as soon as i possibly could um 
as soon as I had the option to, I, tr I uh, started doing computational chemistry, um, which is where you build a computer simulation of the, of the molecule or the reaction, you know, and it's a desk, is a desk job and you're not having to measure out these chemicals that if you spill them over yourself are going to cause you to have cancer or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Something to get out of quite quickly in my, my, uh, uh, yeah, that's so I believe you for, uh, for for getting out of that. To be honest, yeah, it sounds uh, it sounds terrible. I only set a few things on fire. It was fine. <laughs> um, so so yeah, so so the kind of yeah, I guess being away from the lab, that did that kind of make everything a bit easier, and and you, know, you were able to kind of compute your studies. For, yeah, exactly. Studies. So were you kind of using assistive tech then as well? Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah, in my undergrad, I was uh, using like kind of magnification software. And then it was in the first year of my PhD, really, where I stopped being able to read and had to make the switch to um, uh, text to speech software. Um, uh, and that was <laughs> that was quite interesting because we were running like a Linux um, system. So you didn't have any of the um, standard, you know, uh, access yeah. packages available. There was um, a thing called Jovi, which is a, a tiny little program that runs on um, Linux. That was my kind of first introduction to screen reading software, but it helped me get through. So yeah, did its purpose. But, was it that was it was that quite tough then? You know, like going being kind of you know halfway through studies and then you're like starting to get to get worse. Like, you know, that, that must have been quite quite challenging kind of time. It wasn't ideal, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think that I don't really think about, um, I don't really think about uh, that, to be honest, like, it's happened, I can't change it, I don't really have any option but to just get on with it, um, you know, getting wound up about it doesn't help, so, yeah, I try yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's, I guess, I guess it's, uh, it's resilient, right? Hmm, yeah, yeah. No, just, I always just tried to put whatever uh, frustration or into trying to find a solution. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 It seems as if you've been out of and a lot of solutions quite quite well. So. Yeah. Do my best. So. <laughs> <laughs> and did you did you kind of consider um, you know what how geared up the uni was for you know uh, you know uh, assist assist with your was it was it more that you wanted to have like, the, the level of qualification? Um, I think, uh, well, Bath was really great from a um, like provision of uh, assistance point of view. They certainly did, did whatever they could to make sure that, you know, there was assistance in place. Um, and uh, I think it was, for me, going was, yeah, to get the, to get the required qualifications to set you up for, for a career. You know, it's just, um, for the kind of work I wanted to do, it, it's necessary. So yeah, it's just something you had to go and do. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Because I, um, I, I, you know, when I, 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 have, I, was like, when I went to, to uni, I, my, my initial choice was was not from really, but when I <laughs> spoke to them, um, it, you know, they, they went really very well. You know, went really that set up. Um, for the civil students at that point, you know, we're talking early 2000s here, so that's so quite a while ago. Um, and yeah, it, that completely changed my, my decision because I went to, I then went to uh, visit Leeds, Leeds Met University and, um, you know, they were, they were just so on the ball, all with everything and, you know, just I'd kind of, you know, I'd come through school and then I had to go through college and, you know, being the expert and knowing exactly what I needed and, you know, organising people to get my work, you know, get my work braille for me and, and things like that. So I think that I was a bit like, in the uni, I just want that all to be sorted. and we don't really, you know, not really have to think about it anymore, so. I think, I don't think it was actually, I don't think it actually formed that bigger part of my decision-making process on which uni to go to. Um, if I'm honest, I think the... The fact that it was a campus uni and the fact that the sports facilities were excellent were probably, and the course was excellent, those three things are probably what made my, the, the major things that contributed my, to my decision. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. The, um, the uh, I, I also I'm saying that that was a main decision. There was um, the halls of residence had a, had a bar right next to it, which was kind of stopping <laughs> as well. <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was. But I, even that, you know, that was that was quite funny because um, when I when I visited, it was the, the kind of assumed that I'd want to be, in, um, you know, in in accommodation where. Um, which was on, on campus, um, mm -hmm. and the admissions officer, um, she was like, I don't, I don't think you do actually want to be on there. She's like, well, that's all poor scratch. She's like, where, where you want to be is, uh, is in this hall, see, because cause that's where all the first years are, and that's where the parties are and stuff. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I want. I don't care that it's like a couple of miles away, and I'm going to have to get a bus, you know, like, it was, <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of, it was, it was, you know, even though, it was really well geared up, but they didn't really kind of, you know, they didn't think that they knew what was, what was best for me, but somebody else was like, I don't think you want to do that. Right? So, um, yeah, so, I was doing a PhD, though. Was that, was that tough, or? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy. Um, I think it's the big, the big thing is, uh, like, kind of setting your own work, um, because it's a lot less directed, whereas undergrad, you know, you get lectures and you get coursework and then you have exams. And it's quite clear if you do A leads to B leads to C. Whereas in the PhD, it's more self-directed um, and learning about hey, going and searching literature, reading papers, stuff like that. That was a kind of quite a big change. Um, uh, I think that, yeah, it's kind of um, also figuring out um, how to um use accessibility tools on linux and stuff and uh i had to do a reasonable amount of kind of coding in bash which is a scripting language um so working out how to do that i think were the big things in my phd that were kind of tricky um, and also yeah. the level of understanding that you need is kind of the next level up so uh i used a thing called density functional theory for uh, my phd which is quite hard to understand. And I remember for, certainly for the first year, trying to bend my brain around how this thing actually worked was probably the main challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever feel like giving up? Uh, I don't think so, no. I got quite annoyed with, uh, annoyed with it and one, I was quite happy when it was all done and, done and dusted, uh, if I'm honest, because like, <laughs> You work on this thing for you know three odd years or whatever and then uh, you, it's it's handed in and there's a big sense of relief um, yeah. and then do the viva but i do have to say that it's probably like the most anticlimactic thing ever you get you know you come out of your viva and you're like yes that's it oh uh i'm a doctor now and i can change my bank my bank cards <laughs> no, but <it's> <laughs> <laughs> you're like i didn't, I didn't expect to be this much. massive party and it's really underwhelming <laughs> so, uh, I, I know I'd like other, other friends about the, the, the PhDs, and it just sounds like it just sounds like the hardest kind of few years that you, know, yeah. that you can kind of go through. And, and when you've got, you know, well, as you say, when you've got them, you, you've, you've then got to learn, you know, how, how to do all the all the access, you know, how to make them oh. accessible as well. It's like another layer, isn't it, on top of on top of something which is already difficult, and, and you're kind of. I mean, the good thing about a PhD is that it's um, set by, you, you pick what the topic is going to, well, obviously someone picks you, what the topic is going to be. Um, and I don't do, a, this is a, a big piece of advice to anyone thinking about doing a PhD, don't do it unless you're interested in it. Mine was really interesting. Um, and obviously that really helps. Um, but if you're interested in it, it will just be this massive uphill battle. So. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of, you know, like just going back to back to work as well. Like, what you know, if it's something that, that is maybe isn't isn't hasn't got work at the moment, like, you know, what kind of advice would you would you give to them? To people? Um, so I think that I'd probably say um, try and work out what it is you'd like to do, um, if you know, um, and then try and map out like kind of what experience and skills you're going to need to give yourself you know, the best possible chance of getting that role. You know, you don't, you've got to make sure that you can really stand out. And if that means going and doing some work experiences, you know, I mentioned earlier, I went and did this mini pupillage. It's a, 
a way of just getting some experience so you know that a that is the area you want to work in and b when you do get to interview you've got something to talk about um that would be and if you don't necessarily know what you want to do i would say think about um what areas um are kind of in demand you know so at work for example we always need more electrical engineers always there's a real shortage um so kind of think about you know what uh the market needs and whether or not one of those roles is something you might be interested in i don't think there's much point in going and doing a, a role where you know there's not some job prospects for coming out yeah. of it yeah yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think that kind of stuff is something to talk about. It, it, it interviews is really, really important as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's also the case if you've got a gap, you know, if you've got gaps on your CV because you haven't been working for it for a couple of years, you know, if you can show that you've been going and kind of learning new skills and, and getting different experience, you know, that employers, employers do look on that you know, favourably, I think. You know, would, would you agree with that? I mean, there's so many things you can just uh, do without any formal training now, just off the internet. You know, you, you can go and learn Python on the internet, for example. That's a really useful skill. Um, and it was something that is the perfect sort of thing to fill those gaps in your CV. If you go and start, you know, taking some uh, online uh, courses in, you know, Python or something like that, then, then it will um, really stand you in good stead. Uh, Python is a a program language in case anyone doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if anybody, um, on, on that note actually, there, there's, um, for, I, I imagine that this question might come up and, and it'll be about kind of learning coding if, if you can't see and there's actually a really great um, resource online called a free code camp blog. Um, and that can teach, you know, it's all, it's been built with accessibility in mind as well. So it's all really accessible with a screen reader. Um, and it, it has kind of HTML, CSS stuff, and, and it also has Python on there and Java and things like that. So if anybody is interested, um, you know, I'd, I'd really recommend that people go and, go and have a look at that and, and start, to, start to work through that. And that's all completely free. Um, I think I tend to agree that, that kind of digital skills is you know, that, that they're going to be so important as, as we move forward, I think, you know, over the next 10, 15, 20 years. You know, One of the things I think I was really lucky in was that when I was young, my parents spotted early, they got me to touch type basically from the word dot. And that's a yeah. skill that is really has paid huge dividends. So if there's anyone watching, um, you know, with kids who are at, of that age, get them to type properly from the beginning. Um, yeah, that's made a huge difference. I think that's, yeah, really important. Yeah, I'm a bit of, absolutely second that as well. Um, my, my parents were, were really on the ball with that because I lost my sight when I was a little bit. Um, and they, um, they made sure that I was getting to just type lessons at school. And as the transition from primary to secondary school, they kind of made sure that they, they were in place. And, I've got to be honest, all the way through education into work, you know, that, that ability to, to type and, and be able to use my, you know, use the, the computer um, competently is, has been the, you know, the reason why I've been able to, to do, do what, you know, what I've done. It sounds like it was the same for you as well. So. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. No one wants to be one of those people tapping away with two fingers, peering down. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I, I dread to think how slow my time it would be if I was talking with two fingers to the other side. I think I'd be all over the place. So. Uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's really interesting. But, um, yeah, it's kind of... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of move on um, a bit now just to... Just to kind of, you know, I was thinking about... You know, are you happy kind of where, where you are now? Is, is that it? Or do you still have ambitions? Is there still stuff that you, that you want to come to with work? And, and, you know, uh, so I'm happy with where, 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 where I am now for the time being. Um, at some point, you know, uh, maybe get some extra responsibility, etc. But, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm at a stage where I've just gone kind of up a grade and I'm, you know, I'm about at the right level at the moment. There's plenty of challenge. Uh, where I am so yeah 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's, yeah, that's really positive. And you know, is there is there any uh, any more learning that you're doing at the moment, or you know, after doing yeah, you kind of kind of done? So, um, so after my PhD, uh, the big thing was when I started in IP, I went to Queen Mary's to do a postgrad certificate in, in, in IP law. Uh, okay. That was like kind of critical that you, that's required um, to, to function in the IP industry, really. You know, you've got mm. to understand it. Um, so there are some more kind of professional training on um, courses on like portfolio management. Um, that I've kind of got my eye on for CPD in the future. Um, so I'll probably do those at some point. But once you get to a certain level, you kind of have to, it's quite hard to fit the CPD in because, you know, you've got a load of other responsibilities and stuff. So yes. it's always a challenge, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, time, and time and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, yes, it's it's like it's like going really well. Oh, yeah. I, so was it a promotion that you got recently? Uh, yeah, a year and a bit ago. So oh, yeah. Yeah. last year went up to principal. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. And uh, I'll play it. works. Eng one, eng two, senior principal. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this yeah. you know, transition to the to above being a few, a few weeks out. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that was me. Um, yeah, was that kind of transition up to the next grade kind of fairly, fairly smooth then? Yeah, I think so. Um, so uh, yeah, it helps to kind of have a have a plan and work out what your development needs are. Um, and you know, with uh, HR and my boss, we've you know sat down and planned that out and worked out what going up to the next grade grade looks at looks like. So because uh, I went up last year, um, you know, I'm going to be in grade for. A, for a little while now and then you know in a couple of years we'll look about you know what what does the next grade what will the requirements of the next grade look like and and take it from there really yeah 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 no, that's, that's that's really 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 great stuff um i'm i'm kind of going to move on to the climbing as well because oh, yeah? um yeah <laughs> just because um you know it was part of the promotion and i, I actually think it's you know it, it's I'm, I'm interested as well and i'm sure other people are so yeah you know like I, and I, I i you might disagree with me but i i think that you know i, I imagine that climbing requires quite a lot of quite a lot of resilience and, and quite a lot of planning and, and that's stuff which you've all you, you've kind of put into your career and your education as well so yeah i think there's definitely some commonality in um like your mental approach climbing is hard right um so you've got to be able to, you know, deal with the adversity that it sometimes presents you with. Um, that's certainly kind of a bit of a theme. Um, I think when in 2017, we went on an expedition to Greenland and, uh, you know, the average daytime temperature was minus 15 down to like minus 30 overnight. Um, camping on the glacier for a month it takes a certain level of kind of, shall we say grit or bloody mindedness. <laughs> suck that up so yeah I think yeah i'm sure if you if you have a cup with that then uh you know <laughs> trying to figure out how to how to make something uh you know how, how to make your assistant tech work on linux is kind of small fry i guess in comparisons so. i guess that you get used to uh problem solving there's almost always a solution it's just about finding it yeah yeah and and, and that's true of life isn't it i think you know yeah. there's you know there, there's always a, always a solution and, and as, as blind, blind people, you know, you're always looking at a way that you can do it differently to, to somebody who's, who's it. You know, I'm, I'm forever, you know, problem solving in that way to think, okay, you know, there's this, there's this that I've got to do in this, I'll do it that way, but there's no way that I can do it that way. So, you know, how, how does it, how does it work for me? So. But, um, yeah, can you, like, tell me a bit about how, because, uh, yeah, how, how do you climb if you, if you can't see? Because it looks terrifying. Yeah, so that's quite a difficult question to answer. So the first thing to say is there's loads of different forms of climbing. Climbing is a bit like cycling where, you know, in the velodrome, you've got the uh, team pursuit, the uh, Kier and all these different disciplines. Climbing is the same. Um, so the big split you've got, first of all, is climbing on a climbing wall, like an artificial climbing wall, or there's that's the big kind of, division first off 
Um, so it's probably easiest to describe how it works when you're climbing on an artificial climbing wall. Um, so um, when I'm climbing on an artificial climbing wall, there are all these um, colored holds on the wall um, and those holds denote um, which ones you are and aren't allowed to use when you're climbing up a particular route. Now, obviously I can't see any of them. So um, Molly usually is kind enough to um, act as my sight guide um, you know, um, and what they'll do is they'll either stand at the bottom and shout or use a radio headset to kind of give you instructions about where the next one is. And you probably, there's no strict way of um, doing that, but we use a system based on a clock face. So the next hold will be out at 10 o'clock, say. Um, as you're climbing up, you'll be getting instructions about where the next hold is. Um, and that's kind of you know, you can kind of understand how that works. When you move outside climbing, it becomes a lot more down to what you can feel. So there's no holds. Um, a sight guide might be able to see kind of where cracks are, but it's basically down to me as I'm climbing up to feel for the holds, find them, and use kind of like a sixth sense of where they might be and where I need to put my body weight to, to use those holds and make, make upward progress. Yeah. yeah, And then the next bit is um, the difference between uh, kind of seconding or, and leading. So seconding is when you're climbing outside, someone else has gone up first and they've taken a rope up and you're climbing up after them. So the rope is going up from you. So if you fall off, basically you just sit down on the rope and nothing happens, um, which is a huge different deal to when you're leading. So when you're leading, you're the one going up first There's, and all the rope, the rope is trailing down from you. And um, you, how it works is to minimize the risk, you kind of loop the rope through um, points um, in the rock, either that have been put there from um, people putting metal bolts in if it's a, a what's called a sport route or if it's a what's called a trad route which is where there, there's nothing in the rock you take these special metal wedges and um, you put those into cracks as you go up and that's the bit that most climbers when I tell them that I can't see and that I'm leading they kind of can't really wrap their head around that uh, yeah <laughs> I, I'm How struggling I but yeah. <laughs> I'm struggling I I do it? <laughs> so <laughs> I think the the thing is experience. I've been I've been climbing a hell of a long time, um, and uh, over the over the years, I've worked out systems for how to work out what the appropriate piece of climbing safety equipment is for each crack. So I'll feel a crack with my fingers. I'll slot my hand in. I'll work out what the shape of the crack is by feeling it, and what the size of the crack is relative to my hand, and then I know what piece of gear I need to put in that crack. Um, and I've al I always put all my gear on my, on my harness in a certain order so I can find it without looking, slot it into the crack, and then give a sharp tug, clip the rope through it, and off you go. Um, I got a very simple and straightforward, but it's not. <laughs> oh, yeah, I could well imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I um, yeah, I've, I've, yeah, it, it sounds, um, it sounds, it sounds amazing. Um, yeah, it, it sounds as if that must mentally be kind of it's tricky yeah. Yeah. as well, like, like you know, step keeping Game you, calm you is hard. Um, yeah. so the, thing, the thing I think I enjoy about climbing is it kind of presents you with three challenges simultaneously. There's the first aspect, which is the physical. Am I, am I physically strong enough to pull up on this small hold? And then there's a second aspect, which is the skill of all the rope work and placing the gear to minimize the risk. You know, you can't eliminate it completely, um, but you minimize the risk. And then the third aspect is the psychological, that when you're climbing high above your last piece of gear and you know that if you were to fall off, the consequences would be serious. How do you have the like mental calmness to stop shaking and to you know, push on through and to remain efficient when you're at the most dangerous part? So if, if I'm climbing and I manage to do all of those three things well, that's what you get the satisfaction from, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I'm, I'm right in believing that you've, um, you've kind of led 
is it the old old man of high witches yeah. again i i would not heard of it until um a couple of months ago i, I googled it and again, that just sounds like it's pretty it. awesome maybe maybe pretty you awesome. can explain it like explain what like yeah okay. explain what that is because so the old man of hoy is a sea stack um, which is basically a freestanding pillar of rock that comes straight up out of the sea. Um, it's 137 metres tall, which I think is about mm, twice the height of Big Ben, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's basically this big rock tower. Um, uh, it gets a climbing grade, which um, it's E1, which is pretty hard. It stands for Extreme 1. Um, <laughs> Uh, it overhangs on every side. There's no easy way to get to the top. Um, and yeah, uh, the thing that makes it even harder if you're blind is that because it's a tower, your sight guide can't see you all the time. So there's some sections of it where Molly's on one face of the tower and I climb sideways around this corner onto the other face and there's no direct line of sight between me and her so she can't give me any instructions. Um, pretty exciting. So Molly's, Molly's your partner, right? Yeah, yeah. Molly's my partner. Yeah. That's yeah. That that adds a whole new level to a relationship. That doesn't <laughs> and if, it, if all that wasn't bad enough, it's by full Mars, these massive sea gulls that have a habit of habit of vomiting on you if you get too. Oh. Drunk. <laughs> it's an adventure. But you, yeah. So you led it and, and done it right. Smashed it. Yeah, smashed it. Smashed it. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's really, really, really impressive. So how, did, how did you get into climbing? So uh, I like to joke that I didn't really have a choice. Um, <laughs> my, uh, part of the mountain rescue team uh, in the Lake District when I was little, and he took me climbing basically as soon as I could walk. Um, so right. I, I, I climbed my first route when I was two, and I led my first route when I was 11. So it's something that I've always done. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I learned when my sight was... Yeah, still terrible. Like I was still I was born partially sighted, so I've never yeah. seen. Um, and uh, one of the funniest is that I I was in my twenties before I realised that sighted climbers plan their sequence because I was born <laughs> sighted. I never realised what sighted climbers do is they'll stand at the bottom of the cliff and they'll look up and they'll see all the holds and they'll work out in advance what sequence they're going to use them to use them in. <laughs> Yeah. It never occurred to me that people size like might be good enough to do that. I was like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to ask that actually if there was any uh, like any planning that went into um, you yeah. know before you start doing a route, it, but yeah. I, I guess that's that's impossible for you to do unless does Molly kind of go well. Molly will Molly will look at the route and see. Uh, it's really kind of when you're climbing indoors and the holds are these brightly club coloured blobs screwed yeah. on yeah. quite straightforward. Um, when it's outdoors, it's a lot less so. Um, but yeah, the harder the climb is, the more critical the sequence in which you use the holds becomes. Um, on the easy climbs, there's kind of, there could be multiple ways that you can do it. You know, you could use A, then B, then C, or A, then C, then B. But when it gets harder, there's basically only one way of doing it, and you've got to get it right first time. So, yeah, you've also yeah. got to work out the correct sequence for your body type. So I'm six one, uh, 185 centimeters. Molly's five foot six. Um, so she's got to work out, um, you know, if there's going to be things where I'm going to have to use a different hole because I would be too crunched up. Mm. Or, if because of my extra reach, it means I can reach a hold sooner than she would be able to. So mm, she, yeah, yeah. So. She's kind of like mapping two people's clients and, and yours to this extent. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, but yeah, that's great teamwork. That. Really, yeah. really, really great teamwork. So. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, is, would you say the old man at high is the is that the best climb that you've, that you've ever done? Or is, is there any? Uh, it's certainly up there. Yeah. So what other there. ones kind of stand uh, It's a well-known route. It's kind of pretty famous. Um, and uh, yeah, because it's up in the middle of nowhere, up at, you know, in the Orkney Archipelagos. Um, yeah, the, it, it's, it's, it's pretty famous. Um, so yeah, there's some other ones. I mean, 
I mentioned earlier that we'd been to Greenland um, and uh, when we were in Greenland, we got some first ascents, which means we were the first people to ever oh, climb okay. mountains. Yeah. So that's pretty special, um, you know. Um, and then there is, you know, there are a host of classic routes that I've really enjoyed. I think for me, um, whether or not I enjoy it depends in large part on how well I think I climbed the route. If I made a yeah. epic but still got up it, that's not as enjoyable if I kind of as if I cruised it, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You like the challenge. Yeah. So I mean, uh, last weekend I, I led a route called Left Unconquerable at Stanage, um, which is kind of regarded as a bit of a classic. Um, and I did that really well. Um, so I'm really kind of quite pleased with that. You know, I um I didn't uh have any points where I went up and went down again and kind of got a bit scared, basically just kind of smashed it out. So, um, yeah, I was really pleased with that. Um, that's the ones that, the, when you do it like that, that gives you the most satisfaction. If you, if you kind of mess it up a bit, but kind of get away with it, it leaves a bit of a bitter taste in your mouth. <laughs> I'll be like, yes, got the number one, number one shark stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to see, uh, kind of, yeah, just kind of quick, quick time check, and um, I'm going to ask Penny if we've, if we've received any questions. Um, uh, yeah, we've got a few questions that have been coming in. So, mm -hmm. so there's one from Alex saying, do you think your mental calmness from climbing has helped you in your career? I think so. Um, I think probably the big thing is when you do go stuff like go for interviews, being able to calm yourself down and give a good account of yourself in those situations. You know, interviews, exams and vibers, those are the kind of the high pressure situations that if you're able to stay calm for those, you'll do better than if you're flapping. Um, of course, yeah. And um, another anonymous attendee uh, said, how do you find other work and climbing colleagues treat you? And do you ever face challenges with them due to your sight loss? Mm. I think they, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think I face any challenges because of my sight loss. Um, most of my colleagues probably think I'm mental because I go and climb rocks in my spare time and I can't <laughs> see anything. Um, so they kind of most of them can't really wrap their heads around that. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think they they treat me any different really. Really, um, in my in my role, it's all about having the kind of the technical understanding and those uh, those skills, my sight doesn't really come into it, to be honest. That's one thing that um, I probably would say is that for any blind people thinking about getting into the workplace, try and engineer yourself into a role where you give out information rather than taking it in. Because obviously when you, you're missing one of your primary senses, taking in information becomes quite tricky. Um, so try and get into a role where you're the you're the expert and you're the one that people need to come to to find the information. Yeah. That's really good advice. That's really good advice. Um, Jane is a QTVI. That's a qualified teacher teacher of visual impairment. So she's she's mm -hmm. teaching. She works with children, and young people with vision impairment, and she's asked, "What advice can you give them?" Um, when they feel there's lots of activities and careers that are out of their reach. So I guess it's about inspiring them. So what would, what advice would you give those young people? I think probably to, uh, there's loads of careers that are out of reach for anyone. You know, it doesn't mean that not everyone's going to become an astronaut. Um, you just have to try and pick a career that is accessible to you, that you're going to find interesting and fulfilling. The fact that um, some things might not be suited to you, that 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 is true for everyone not everyone is brilliant at, at maths or english or you know there is not everyone has a full gambit of skills you have to find a career that's aligned to the skills you do have and not worry about the ones you don't okay great um i've got another question around um your calmness um uh, and um kevin's asked what techniques do you use to maintain that calm during a difficult climb uh, have a stern word with yourself. <laughs> um, so quite a lot of it become comes from experience. Um, you've been in similar situations before. You know you know what's coming, um, and you know that um, getting flustered is only going to make the situation worse. If you get flustered, you tend to well in climbing you tend to overgrip, 
which means that you burn through your strength reserves faster. You start to shake, which means that you're more likely to kind of um, slip off the footholds. So you have to have a really kind of a conscious effort to calm yourself down. So uh, establishing a good, deep, steady breathing rhythm often helps with that to try and calm the pulse a bit. Um, uh, there are some techniques that you can do that um, uh, force your brain to kind of think about something else. So if you cross your arms and think about tapping your, uh, your arms alternately, um, that's supposed to uh, be a, a task that your brain finds quite difficult and it will focus on doing that and therefore you're distracting the attention away from the stressful kind of uh, stimulus. It's quite hard when you're climbing though, isn't it? <laughs> you don't do that when you're climbing, but for example, if, if, you're, if you're going into an interview or something like that, or if you're in a competition and you're, wait, you're, you're waiting for your turn to be called to climb, those are the sorts of things that you might be doing. But also think about like all the preparation or all the training that you've done. For me, you know, I've been climbing for years and I've been training um, really hard for the last couple. When I think about the hours and hours of training that I put in, it means that you're ready for the thing that you're about to to take on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'd reiterate that kind of practice stuff as well, you know, particularly for interviews, you know, I think there's so much to be gained by really practicing and doing some mock interviews and, and things like that. There's everybody that's nervous in them situations. So like, if, if you tell me a person that doesn't, then yeah. Honestly, think that the whole audience, so, um, but you know, the way that you mitigate against that is it, as long as you can, you know, you get to that interview, the bar of that interview, and think, well, I've done everything in my power which I can do to, to make sure that more prepared for this, then that kind of brings an air of calmness with it as well. So, I think Martin's right. Like, um, the fear and the nervousness they can never be eliminated, but they can be mitigated. You can develop techniques and experiences to be able to function while you're scared. And that's the important thing, being able to do the task, even though you're scared or even though you're nervous. Sure. And um, was there a point at any moment when you thought, I think this is related to the old men ahoy, um, I can't do this, I, I, I can't do it. Was there any point that you thought that? Mm, no, I don't think so. Um, one of the things I do like about climbing is that it demands total mental focus. You can't be thinking about anything else apart from how am I going to do this next move? Have I got my gear sorted? So I'm not really thinking about, you know, can I do this? I'm just 100% focused on doing it. You don't really, you don't really, you don't have enough mental bandwidth to think about that. Your all your attention is absorbed on the task at hand. Right. Okay. Um, I've had a question in from Robert. What are your long-term career ambitions? <laughs> Oof, uh, I have to think about it. Um, well, I haven't really kind of, uh, I think I'm very happy where I am at the moment. Um, if in, you know, the medium to longer term that involves some extra responsibility, that's fine. Um, but I think that's something that I'm not really kind of focused on at the moment. I think at the moment, uh, getting you know established where where I am and then thinking about moving on to like kind of maybe having a bit of extra responsibility um that's the sort of thing that I would be um thinking about okay great um I th this is a question from earlier when we were talking about um tech accessible tech and Jonathan asked um, where, is, where is the accessible free coding website? I don't know if that's for Martin or for you. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, th I, think that, I think that's me. Uh, what I can do is we can, uh, we can send it out along with the, um, along with the, the link for, the, uh, for the people to rewatch the webinar. But I think off the top of my head, it's freecodecamp.org, I think. But if you Google free code camp, um, it should bring it up. Great. Thanks. And Jonathan added that Azabat is a great typing tutor. So uh, sharing that with everyone. Um, so uh, going back to the climbing, someone's asked uh, around all the climbing walls are closed. So how have you continued to train? Uh, so I'm very lucky. I've got some training bits and bobs in my garage. Um, so I've got things called a fingerboard, which is, um, how do I describe that? That is 
a um, piece of wood with various different size slots cut into it that you practice hanging from your fingers on. Um, and then you can adjust the difficulty by strapping weight to yourself. So uh, I set myself the target in lockdown that because all the walls are closed, I've got no op, I can't go to them, but I, I do have a fingerboard. So I'm going to try to improve my maximum finger strength. Because for me, that was a relative weakness. My endurance is pretty good, but my absolute finger strength wasn't that great. So I've been really working on that. Hopefully I've made some gains. We'll see when the uh, walls reopen. But also the other thing is that now um, we can go climbing outside. Um, so we've been going on day trips to the peak, up to the Peak District and got quite a lot of, quite a lot of routes done, which has been great. Great. Um, so Katie's asked, do you have any tech challenges with work computer systems? I, I don't know if that's work computer systems. Do you have any tech challenges with work computer systems? Uh, I don't think so particularly. Some of the outdated pieces of software aren't great. So the holiday booking management system that we have at work is, I don't know, written in the 1980s or something. It's awful. Um, but uh, I think that's the only one. And, you know, I don't need to use that very often, you know. So on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. And Valentin um, has asked what your diagnosis is. I don't know if, he's relate if that relates to your eye. I My eye condition, yeah. Uh, so I have retinitis pigmentosa, uh, more specifically, I have an error in my CRP1 gene. So what that means is, is the, the retinas, the light sensitive cells at the back of my eye are slowly degrading. Um, so the structural proteins that act as a bit like a scaffold to hold the back of the retina haven't formed properly. So over time, it's all kind of crumbling into little breadcrumbs. Mm. Okay. Well, it's, it's uh, gone six o'clock. Um, we've answered most of, most of the questions. For those that um, we didn't manage to get to, any outstanding questions we, we can put on the um, we can put on the website. But uh, I guess as it's gone six, it's it's probably time to close the session. Yeah, but I guess just to say, like, thank you very much, Jesse, for for joining us tonight. I've I found it really like really interesting hearing about about the job and, and how you got there and you know, the kind of resilience that you've you know, had throughout that whole process and, and having that goal and, and achieving it. I think it's you know, really, 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 um, you know, really impressive and, and you know, I think you should give a lot of credit to yourself. Um, but yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much thank for joining you. us. Um, it's, been, it's been really great. No, brilliant. Yeah. No, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Cool. Okay. Well, for everybody else, um, there'll be more updates. We're going to do more of these. So, um, yeah, take care.